geez, so we'll get started with uh, gay science. And um, I'd like to introduce Alex Romero, who is a master's student, a newly minted master's student at um, UC Denver. And he works in Chris Miller's lab, and I think a lot of you guys know Chris. He is one of the people who did uh, the nested pilot study on the fecal microbiome in some of our birds and troopers, and is now doing a much expanded study, and a lot of all the, of us on the girls' team and scientific programs have met Chris. So Alex is actually going to introduce himself and his educational background, and then today he's going to talk to us a little bit about the GI microbiome, and Alex's project is going to be um, based on using the samples that Chris is working with for girls. So welcome, Alex. Yeah. Thank you, as uh, Kelly mentioned, my name is Alex Romero, and I want to thank everyone for being here today and making it in. Uh, I want to give you a brief introduction into the microbiome. Uh, before starting, I just want to mention that I, with much effort, limited my gratuitous usage of golden retriever pictures to five, <laughs> all of which came from the Morris Foundation website. So this is a brief overview of today's presentation. I want to start by, by introducing myself and telling you a little bit more about me. Then I want to give you a simple overview of what a microbiome is, why it's important, and the, appro the approaches we have to studying a microbiome with a couple of examples. Next, I want to share some interesting microbiome-related studies and talk about the Golden Retriever Life Study Project as an example of a microbiome pro project. And finally, I'll leave some time at the end for some questions. So a little bit about me, uh, like Kelly mentioned, I'm a newly graduate student uh, with Chris Miller in his lab yeah. that will be working on this project. <laughs> uh, thank you, I'm very excited. Let me start by saying I first met uh, Chris in his bioinformatics course about four years ago now, and he's the one that got me interested in research. I actually went off on my own and started to gain more experience and background in doing other types of research, mostly focused on health and epidemiology. And most recently when I heard about the opportunity of working with him again on this project, I was very excited to come back to bioinformatics and learn a little bit more and see what I can learn about dog health and how uh, I can use some of the knowledge I've gained on my own, uh, working at the CU Denver's Latino Research and Policy Center, uh, doing some epidemiology work in dogs and see what things I can find out about dog health. So uh, for, from my experience working at the Latino Research and Policy Center, um, I had the Opportunity to do a couple of uh, posters and conferences. I had a poster at Supercomputing 2017. I also had a presentation at the American Thoracic Society uh, conference in two 2019. Um, but I can't say enough how I am so excited to come back into bioinformatics and dive deeper into uh, the project we're working with you guys. So let's start off by asking what is a microbiome? It's the collection of microorganisms such as bacteria, fungi, archaea, or viruses. These guys right here, it's mostly bacteria that we find or characterize within a specific environment. And a specific environment is the important part of that. So we have a microbiome on our skin, so there's the skin microbiome. But it's different depending on where you're looking. So you can be looking at the skin microbiome at the forehead and that'll be different from the skin microbiome at the paws or feet of a person or dog. And the same can be said for our GI tract. It varies by location and it's not continuously the same throughout the GI tract. From section to section, uh, we see differences in the communities of uh, microorganisms that live there. So what? Uh, why are these important? These microorganisms are important because if we want to understand health in this animal or we need to understand disease in this animal, we need to understand, there's a good chance we need to understand the microbes living in and around this animal every day. And humans, research suggests that the, microorganism, that the microorganisms within us and on us make up a few pounds of our total body weight. That's how important they are. Consider that for a second. Yet, we know little about the microorganisms in our dogs. 
However, we have realized this and researchers have started to investigate. One study found that the dog gut and tongue, and tongue microbial community are somewhat similar in diversity and composition, but still distinct from humans. In this study, the findings suggest that our pets not only harbor a diverse microbial community, but also that they shed a microbial community and that it influences our own microbial composition. If we look at this figure along the x-axis here, we have 969 total samples of human and dog participants split up into different regions of micro microbiome sampling. So we can see here, we're looking at the human forehead compared to the dog forehead, looking at a human's left palm, right palm versus dog paws. Each line estimates how much of each microbe is in uh, each sample, all of which adds up to 100%. We'll talk about methods to use methods used to measure these abundances later, but basically the many line the many thin lines placed together like this allow us to see and characterize the microbiome easier than if we were to look at a thousand different pie charts for each individual person, seeing what their particular microbial community looked like. But this is a very high level analysis. It's like if an ecologist were to go into the wilderness and from a distance look at what animals are present. They might see lions, elephants, zebras. That's the kind of level we're looking at. We don't really know what's happening. We're just identifying who is there at this point. But what it does allow us to do is, if we do this enough, it allows us to, it allows us to characterize what does healthy look like and what does disease look like. And that gives us a great insight into identifying what are the micro microbes that are related to each condition. From a 10,000 foot view, we see that there's patterns that are distinct in each site and distinct between dogs and humans. It's unknown if we can translate that work from uh, humans to dogs, but this suggests that it might be worth exploring. Specifically because what would be similar samples are uh, still pretty different and show different abundances of microorganisms as well as, as we drill down, specific micro, microbiomes, uh, as we drill down to specific microbiomes, we might find even more differences. But keep in mind that microbial communities are not stagnant, and they do change. So microbial communities are actually impacted and change with our behavior and daily exposures. And throughout our lives, our microbial communities and their makeup change with us. Every time you eat something toxic, your microbes are exposed to that toxin and potentially neutralize it for you. Anytime you are exposed to a pathogen, your immune system is aided by the microbes that lived with you as a child or that you were exposed to as a child, and they help you fight it off. And Every time you shake hands with someone, you exchange microbes with them. If you, live with some, if you live with a significant other, the mere fact that you live together actually means that you're likely to share many of the same microbes on your skin and even in your gut just because you spend so much time together and share the space. But the same can be said for dogs. Dogs that cohabit likely will have similar microbiomes and share many of the same microorganisms on their uh, body as well as their gut. Dog owners share the same microbes as their dogs. So in the same study that I was talking about previously, uh, another of their findings were that actually dog owners are more similar in their microbial composition to other dog owners than non-dog owners, meaning that uh, in the case of everyone here, you're more likely to share more of the same microbes on your skin than anyone else working in other uh, offices in the building where they don't allow dogs. Because you are having that interaction with dogs and potentially um, are playing with, if not petting, others' dogs, everyone doing that at the same time shares the microbial communities and potentially makes, and, uh, makes you healthier and improves your health. Uh, in this figure, along the x-axis, uh, we have the total number of microbes that are 
shared between dogs and dog owners. So here we're just comparing uh, dog body sites and seeing how many of the microbes that dogs had were shared by dog owners. So in the blue here, uh, we're looking at um, a dog's forehead compared to a human's forehead. Uh, that was a dog owner. How many of the microbes did they share? And we're seeing that there. And then forehead compared to the human's uh, left palm, right palm, uh, paw compared to forehead, paw compared to uh, left palm, right palm. And so in the blue here, uh, we're looking at dog owners. And in the red, we're seeing other dog owners that have uh, this more similar microbes than uh, non-dog owners. However, the insight this provides is just scratching the surface of what we're actually able to do with this kind of data. In humans, there's strong associations that have been made between the structure of microbial communities and many diseases such as obesity, diabetes, allergies, infl inflammatory uh, bowel disease, inflammation, periodontal disease, and the list goes on. Every time you look, there are differences between what is healthy and what is uh, disease uh, in the microbial samples that we collect. But most of the studies are just associations. And we do not have an understanding of what is actually cause and effect from these types of studies. Does diabetes cause a change in microbial communities? Or do certain microbes within, uh, within us or on us cause diabetes? No idea. So it's, imp it's important to understand that we only have associations for the most part. But in humans, at least, progress has been made into determining cause and effect with some really powerful studies. One study found that transplanting the gut, the gut microbiota, basically taking a sample from small large intestine of someone with a autism spectrum disorder and putting those microbes into a germ-free mouse, germ-free being a mouse that's uh, free of all microbes, doesn't have anything on it. It's very hard to make, and they make them specifically for these kind of tests. When you take that autism spectrum disorder microbiota, put it into that mouse, you start to see hallmark, um, you start to see uh, hallmark autistic behaviors in those mice. Then, if you take the healthy gut microbiota from a normally developed mouse and transplant that back into that germ-free mouse that was uh, given autism spectrum disorder microbiota, you actually see improvement in behavioral abnorm abnormalities and you see a modulated neural exc excitability in the brain. They went on to propose in this study that the, the, the gut microbiota regulates the behavior in mice via the production of uh, neural metabolites. Basically, the microbes that digest stuff are linked to how brain processes occur. In other words, we're finding more and more links to generate cause and effect understandings in humans. And it seems that the gut microbiome plays a very important role. Another study in humans identified microbes as well as uh, what they might be doing in a healthy human. And this study is similar to the one I showed you before uh, between the relationship of dog, uh, dogs and dog owners and their microbes. So on these graphs down here, we're looking at uh, 247 individuals, or sorry, 242 individuals um, represented across the axis here. Uh, here are stool samples. Uh, identifying the relative abundance of each microbe uh, within each stool sample, all adding up again to 100%. Uh, what was interesting about this study is that they didn't just stop there and they took it the step further and asked, okay, these are the microbes that are here, now what are they doing? So a way of doing that is you look at what they metabolize or what they eat. So the next part of this is they um, identified the metabolites of these microorganisms uh, to see what 
interactions they actually might be playing in the system to try and characterize what a healthy gut microbiota looks like versus um, disease. And in the last human study that I'll uh, tell you about, researchers looked at the gut microbiome across age and geography. In this graph, the y-axis is simply how many microbes they were able to identify, while the x-axis is just age. Uh, if you look at the trends in age, as you can tell, our diversity in uh, microbiome increases as we age, but it increases for some more than others. No age trends. Uh, that are affected by mode of birth. Uh, it's been found that children that are uh, delivered by C-section as opposed to vaginally uh, tend to have less microbes on them and have a slower start on gaining that microbial communities within them. Uh, also, breastfeeding and antibiotic use uh, play a role. But other things that you can tell from this uh, specific graph here is the difference in Population. So in blue, we are looking at U.S. metropolitan, U.S. urban areas. Uh, while in the green here, we're looking at hunter-gatherer cultures in Venezuela and the Amazon. And in the red, we're looking at um, again hunter-gatherers uh, in Africa that are in very rural area. And the general trend that we see here is that even across age, we start to see more diverse microbial communities in those hunter-gatherers than in urban US uh, city participants. Uh, for this study, there was 351 participants, and the results showed that age-associated changes in the genes involved in uh, vitamin biosynthesis and metabolism uh, were different among the different communities um, looked at. Now, this is where we're at with dogs. In the last couple of years, studies have started to gain a mechanistic understanding of disease and determine cause and effect relationships in humans. But for dogs, we've just begun to see uh, research looking at characterizing or finding associations between the gut microbiome and disease. This study found that dogs with irritable bowels had distinct microbial communities compared to healthy dogs, uh, but that was about it. We're here looking at uh, what does it look like for humans. Um, uh, here we're looking at what it looks like for humans and basically how this works, it's just a um, way of simplifying things. So if we have uh, the Y bar and the X bar, we have basically two characteristics that we're looking at. And the closer that two points are uh, to the origin here is that uh, both characteristics are near identical. If we see them further apart, that means that they're not anywhere similar. So it helps us to conceptualize um, differences in a 3D space by a dimensional reduction technique. So here we're just basically trying to identify if there's clustering of health and disease. And we see that there's a lot of overlap between dogs that in the lighter uh, brown had no irritable bowel disease uh, as opposed to the darker brown here did have irritable bowel disease. But there's some overlap on both sides. So it's nothing conclusive, but it starts giving us an idea that there is some differences that we can see in dogs but that it, it looks very different from the microbial communities in humans. So these two are definitely not the same, giving us reason to understand that we need to start looking at dogs specifically if we want to understand dogs. So how can we do this? Approaches to studying the, the uh, microbiome. On the left here, we have uh, ways that microbial communities have been studied for a very long time, but these are very difficult to actually do. The top left image here is a bacterial isolate grown on an auger plate. An auger plate is just basically a plate that has nutrients or food specific for a certain microorganism uh, to be able to grow on it. We use it to try and culture uh, organisms to study them more. 
However, most organisms are very hard to culture and for the most part we're unable to um, grow many organisms at all. And more importantly than that, the growth that we do see on these plates aren't actually representative of the life that is present in the sample. Below that is uh, this Epiflorence uh, microscope and next to it is an image with a dye stain uh, of bacteria. In this case it's E. coli at 600 times magnification. Both of these are useful but when it comes to characterizing the gut microbiome and exploring the differences in um, the communities that we find, they provide very little information. Now, on the right side is a bacterial, a bacterial gene, a DNA sequence that has actually amplified from one of the dog samples that we got in the 400 dog samples that we received for this project. And this sequence is a segment this segment, sorry, is like a bacterial name tag. What we can do with this is actually basically what you would do if you uh, didn't know something and you wanted to uh, find it on Google. You take that information, you put it into a search function, and it'll find it to you, for you. Uh, by me saying that, we actually do that in a very automated fashion, but um, there are very simplistic ways that if you have very few samples you can do individually and it's a free service on NCBI's uh, website which is basically a collection of all the microbial genes um, that have so far been discovered and shared with that organization and so if we have time at the very end I can briefly show you uh, manually what we of course do in a very automated sense to identify what this bacterial gene is and how simple that is. So the first steps to char characterizing a microbial community is extraction of DNA from the environment that we're interested in. If you can extract the DNA, the DNA sequencing is cheap and honestly quite easy to do. The hard part requires computation and bioinformatics to actually create meaning from the results that you obtain. But the sequencing is quite simple because all you have to do is collect the sample, mail it away, and the facility that has uh, the sequencers can just run hundreds of samples, thousands of samples simultaneously and produce results quite quickly. How cheap is DNA sequencing? It costs about a cent, one and a half cents uh, per megabase pair, which means very little to you right now. A megabase pair, uh, for example, on average is um, half the size of a bacterial, a bacterial gene. So the average bacterial gene has anywhere from uh, one to 14 megabase pairs in it. So if it costs about a cent and a half to process, we're able to process the genes of tons and tons of bacterial uh, samples in order to see who's present very effectively. And to give you some context of how cheap this has gotten, in 2001, it roughly cost about $100 million to um, sequence the first human genome. Currently, it costs uh, about $1,000 to do so. So the amount of reduction in cost that we've seen has been exponential. Um, and if interested at the end, I can discuss more the exact methods that we actually use to run those flow cells. But for now, let's jump into what are the three types of sequencing based microbial ecology that we can do. We can do two types of shotgun uh, sequencing and then there's 16 SR RNA sequencing. So with shotgun metagenomic sequencing, we're able to identify who is there, what they might be doing as far as interacting with their environment, but not with any certainty. And we can do this by looking at specific genes genes being small portions of the genome, or we can just look at the entire genome and say, all right, tell me everything. With metatranscriptomics, what we do is actually very focused just on genes specifically. Look at, okay, what is this gene doing in the environment 
in this bacteria, in this microorganism. With 16S RNA, 16S rRNA sequencing, what we do is identify exactly who is there in a very gene-centric fashion. So we look at just a very specific gene that's conserved across all bacteria and that have just very small variable sections to see who is all there. So in more detail, shotgun metagenomics is us getting a sample. In this case, let's talk about the Golden Retriever project. We can collect the feces sample, and then we extract all the DNA. All this DNA is just this circular DNA here. It's basically inaccessible, and we don't know what to do with it at that point. So why we call it shotgun metagenomics is because we basically take all those samples, we put it into a shell, we cock it, and we just blast it and just shred it to pieces. And now that we have it shredded to pieces, we can actually uh, start getting to each little section and identifying what letters are there, what genes are there. So we're able to identify those little sections very easily. And how we do that is by putting it onto this uh, flow cell to be able to have primers, basically little things that will have specific letters that will bind to the little segments of DNA in order to uh, continue to build upon that sequence. So DNA is double-stranded, and we, when you just have a single strand, it naturally wants to build that uh, second strand around it. And by doing that, we're able to identify what we have. And here's the primers that I'm talking about, and this is how we can build the unknown regions and identify what we have. We take those uh, contigs, or the portion of DNA that we've built, and now we can have a genome reference. Genome reference, uh, References are uh, already exist because of all the work that's been done with 16 uh, sRNA sequencing. So we know what to expect for different microbes. So we take what we have and we then start stacking it underneath unknown to see do we have this. And what we do is we continue to do that until we are able to basically place every little segment into a category of, okay, you're this bacteria or you're that bacteria. And that uh, tells us not only who is there, but also uh, gives us insight into what metabolism they might have and what they might be doing. With metatranscriptomics, we do basically the same, but it's much more focused on a specific gene. So now we know exactly who we're targeting and we're selecting that one circular DNA and then we're shredding it and only focusing on a specific gene of interest to understand better what is the environmental impact that it has in the community that we've pulled it from. With 16S rRNA gene sequencing, it's a lot more targeted and a lot more specific. So like I mentioned earlier, uh, bacteria have a, the 16S RNA, rRNA gene that's conserved throughout with just these variable regions. So these variable regions here is how we identify what exact microorganism or bacteria we're looking at. So because these areas in gray are conserved and do not change across the board, we're able to prepare primers or basically we know what sequencing or we know what letters A, T, C's, and G's we need in order to build upon the variable regions. And by focusing on a specific region, what we can do is build unknown regions to identify who we exactly have inside the sample. What that allows us to do is create a tree like this where we can identify what are the bacteria that live there, what are the archaea that live there, and everything else. Most studies still are done with 16S rRNA sequencing because it's cheap and it gives you a broad picture of what's going on in the area. Why else is it powerful? Uh, because it's so rich in context. It's been done for the last three decades now, so we have built up many libraries with a lot of information of what things look like, so we can identify them very easily and very cheaply by using this method. By doing this, we allow ourselves to focus in on what's important and get a better idea of where we need to focus in our efforts and our money to better understand specific microorganisms rather than uh, going all out to begin with. Because the price difference between shotgun metagenomics and 16S RNA is uh, 
a hundredfold. So with uh, 16S RNA, you can spend um, about $10 and get 100 samples. With uh, shotgun metagenomics, you can spend about $10 and get one sample. So the amount of information that we gain from using this method is much more uh, beneficial early on. So how are we using this in the Golden Retriever Lifestyle <coughs> Project in CU Denver? We're using it to characterize what is health and disease when looking at lean and obese uh, golden retrievers. We're looking to explore what can be characterized in the, in the gut microbiome as healthy and disease between these two. Uh, the advantages that we have for this project is that we have a large initial sample of 400, 200 normal, and 200 overweight, and we're able to do lots of replication with it. And we have really rich metadata that we can explore into potentially identifying other reasons for differences we might find in the characterization of the gut microbiome. And more importantly, something that I've not seen in my uh, research into other studies is that it's a single breed study. A lot of other projects face the problem of working with multiple dog breeds and the way that that influences the characterization of their gut microbiome or other um, microorganisms on their body is really hard to distinguish between what's being what's been different because of the breed versus because of health, uh, age, etc. Now the other thing that's uh, also really important that I wanted to bring up is that the opportunity to reform the general biology freshman labs by giving them authentic research experiences is tremendous. By having uh, undergraduate students actually work on real science and real work and gathering samples and then processing those samples. Uh, it gives us an experience that before wasn't available to them. And now this is just some uh, early results from a couple of years ago when uh, Chris Miller did the first uh, run on this. And here we have um, eight rule 14 suburban and two uh, urban dogs, and we're looking at the differences in the quantities of different microorganisms within each sample. So we can already start to see that there's some differences in the microbial composition of dogs uh, by age and where they live. And so this is similar to the human microbiome project where they were trying to characterize the healthy gut microbiome in humans, but just as a much smaller scale. So we haven't been able to get a lot yet, but it's fascinating. Uh, it's a fascinating start. Um, here we see in some dogs that there's more quantities of fossobacterium, which was previously noted to be in dogs that are generally allowed to be outside more. So we're starting to see that in rural dogs, and that kind of does make sense. OK, so presentation highlights. My name is Alex Romero, and I hope that today I uh, helped you understand a little bit about what the microbiome is and how it's specific to the environments um, that contain different microorganisms. Um, even though we can't see them, they're actually very important to our lives, and we most likely wouldn't be able to live without them. There are strong associations that we have been able to find between health and disease in humans with the, micro, uh, with the microorganisms within our guts, and in humans that has led to a mechanistic understanding to explore the potential therapeutics. I believe that in the near future, we'll do the same with dogs. That we'll start by uh, characterizing what is health and what is disease, but that we'll be able to actually take it a step further, just like we have in humans, and start looking for potential therapeutics to address what is disease once we know what is healthy with the knowledge that we gain through this project. I discussed with you the differences between shotgun sequencing and 16S RNA sequencing. Basically, one, we're able to capture a lot of information, but it's very expensive per sample. And on the other one, we're able to capture a ton of who is there, but not much information about them. But it's very cheap and affordable to do, and we can do it quickly. Lastly, I just want to mention again that we are very excited about the Golden Retriever Life Study Project at CU Denver, uh, me especially, because this is what I'll be working on for the next two years. <laughs> and uh, lastly, with such rich metadata, provide many opportunities for growth on this, and 
I'm just so excited and talking just briefly with Missy uh, about the opportunities that we have to explore <laughs> other <laughs> work. Thank you. That's all I have. And now if there's any questions. Yes. Um, so you mentioned that the dog owners were healthier than non-dog owners. Is that because there's like a diversity of the microbiome? So um, could, I should rephrase that. No, I should rephrase that. Uh, so it's not that they're healthier, it's just that um, having a more diverse uh, microbial community has been seen in healthier populations. So uh, what dog owners, uh, what they were seeing in there is that they have uh, more uh, microbes and more of those are shared among their dogs. So that's one indication that could be uh, signs of healthier people. Okay, so it's not necessarily Yeah, it's more of an association than a cause and effect. Yes. So if you want to characterize healthy dogs and diseased dogs through the gut microbiome, do you really <coughs> need the shotgun metagenomics approach to have the level of detail necessary? Not to begin with. So if we're only looking to characterize what is healthy and what is not, uh, 16S RNA is the best approach just because of the cost effectiveness. Once we've had that characterization and we see what microorganisms uh, are actually present, and if uh, we find that there are differences and specific differences that we're interested in, that's uh, potential for us to come back now through with shotgun metagenomics to actually explore the differences that we're actually interested in uh, more deeply. So you would then choose a subset of the whole, like like if you were looking at the girl study, for example, you could do the 60 next sequencing, for example, in the whole cohort, mm -hmm. and then depending on the associations that you see with other data sets, then you can choose a subset of the girl's population, for example, for deep sequencing? Potentially. Potentially. Uh, it might not just be, we could, instead of focusing on a subset of the samples, we instead could focus on all the samples, but just a subset of the microorganisms that are present to explore exactly what are those microorganisms doing in these places. Are they beneficial? Is, is there something going on with their metabolism? Is there something that they're doing in the environment that is directly associated with um, an obese dog compared to a lean dog? So it's more so of nailing down what does it mean that these dogs had these microorganisms versus these microorganisms. Yes? Um, so sort of general question. Yeah. Um, through your studies, um, education research, have you found a part of the body, human or dog, that has a surprisingly diverse microbiome? Obviously besides the stomach. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I would say the best way of answering that is actually what I found to be most interesting is how it can change over time and through the interactions that you have. So, so let's say that if you were right now to decide, you know what, I'm going on vacation for a month, that decision actually will have an impact on your uh, microbiome throughout your body. Skin, gut, everything else, because the food that you'll be eating is different. The things that you'll be touching are different. The people that you'll be interacting with are different. Um, so for me, the potential in the diversity and the ever-changing composition of the microorganisms on and within you has been the most fascinating that I've learned so far. Yeah, thank you. Oh. Thank you again so much, I appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs>